Do you remember uh, doing Danger Fields? <laughs> Dude, I was at Dangerfields the last time Rodney went on stage. I was on the show he was on. It was incredible, man. Are you serious? I came in. It was a Saturday night. I mean, he was he died like about a month after that. And uh, Tony, who right. runs this, the place, it was packed because it's Bridge and Tunnel Saturday night. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mike Britt is uh, emceeing. And he goes... Mike to, Britt's a beast. Beast. So yeah. funny. So funny. And uh, Tony goes, listen, Rodney's in the crowd. A lot of people don't know what he's sitting with his wife right up front in his robe, uh, and he's going to come on after you, Pete. And, uh, you know, he, he liked the guy. I'm, he didn't even really. He was very old, you know, so right. it wasn't going to be much of anything. So uh, I'm going to do 15 minutes in front of Rodney. The guy's, like, going to die any day. I try to do every joke I ever written in 15 minutes. Like, he might uh. bop up, shake my hand, and go, let me make a few phone calls for you. <laughs> the guy didn't even know he was indoors, Billy. And I'm rattling off all my, right? So I get off. I stand off to the side. And uh, Mike Britt introduces Rodney. Place goes crazy, okay? Rodney gets up. He's walking so slow. It's, it's like from here to the wall. And it takes him, like, 20 minutes, that 15. Five solid minutes with his wife helping him. The people even stopped clapping, so I started clapping so they'd keep the clap. I mean, keep the clap going. Right, he, right. He grabs the mic in a perfect Rodney voice. If you close your eyes, he's not, he, he grabs the mic and about Mike Brady goes, how about another round of applause for the moon yarn, huh? <laughs> 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 Mike Britt's not cracking up to it, and he puts his arm around Mike Britt. He does about a minute and a half, some joke. It was very funny and worked, and then he and then he shuffled off, and then he passed away in about a month. Wow. Yeah, and I didn't meet him or shake his hand or anything because he was back in the crowd, and I had to get back down to the cellar. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> the thing about Dangerfields, now, when we came to New York, that club was like, it was in a bad place where it was just like <clears throat> they had comics that had been working there since the fucking place had opened and if they and it just I went in there one night dude and, and that was one of those nights where I felt like quitting comedy. I watched this I'm not gonna say this comic's name, but I saw this guy on stage and it was the most bleakest, darkest, like the negativity that was hanging in the fucking air. And then what happened was Jim Norton. Yes. You just said his name. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh my god, dude. <coughs> like I, I watched three minutes of that guy's set and if I had, if there was a gun in the room I would have had it in my mouth. I would have shot him first just out of just humanity. <laughs> yeah. How fucking bleak this guy was. So Yeah, that's the kind of guy you want to play in a movie to win your Oscar, an independent film playing oh. that what are you going home to? What are you doing when you get home, man? Right. And he was sitting in there and like, dude, I'm I'm not lying, I love Dangerfield, but the reverb on that mic was fucked up for like seven years straight. Nobody adjusted it. And you know what was the worst is if you did like a high energy bit and there was nobody in there, that fucking echo, you know, which sounds great on like a Dean Martin album, like fills yeah, out his yeah, voice. But yeah. if you're fucking doing like singing, I mean, I'm doing jokes, it, you're eating your balls. But Norton was the guy that first started doing it. Yes. You and guys got to go there. You get to do a half, half hour. You yep. get $25. Norton single handedly, I think, saved that place because he got us yeah. all to go there. I remember everybody was giving him shit. I remember Patrice, rest his soul, goes, uh, he goes, where are you coming from, Norton? He goes, Dangerfield? And he goes, yeah. And he goes, oh, yeah. He goes, Who, he goes, who'd you go on after, Ruth Buzzy? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, every, and everybody's <laughs> dying laughing. And Norton defended it, though. He was going, dude, you got to go up there. So I was living on the Upper East Side like you, and you and I started doing it. Yeah. And then I remember Sherrod came in, and then there was this great thing. It just all of a sudden just fucking turned around. Yeah, all saved those it. those older guys took off and left. And uh, but what was weird was that you know, and as cool as the decor remained, the exact same. Like if you're into like shit from back in the day, you got to go to Dangerfields. I mean, oh, it, it literally looks like you think you feel like Johnny Carson is going to come walking in when he still had like jet black hair or brown hair and shit. Like when when you're sitting there with those those little fucking those little lampshades and stuff. Yeah, and everybody writes their initials on the lampshades. And uh, it's literally like a lounge in Vegas from 1970. They only have male waiters, and the waiters all still wear the red jackets. Career waiters, too. Yeah. And it's it's just, a you know, I mean, the photos on the wall when you first come in, because, like, Billy Joel did a song for Easy, Easy Money for Rodney's movie, so there's a photo of Billy Joel was there and, you know, Sinatra and all these great Elvis. people there. But Elvis the, with Rodney. But then the thing would happen after a while, Bill, is I would play there, and uh, then I'd be back at the cellar, and, you know, sometimes in between spots, everyone sits around and chats, and I'm, I'm running out, and one's like, where are you going? My guy, I got a danger field. And he's like, well, oh, you still got a danger field? <laughs> like, it, it, it stopped. and I Because it got to the point where it was 75 bucks, I live around the corner, and I'd be like, how can I not bop in 
and just get a quick 75. Tell I a few. Fu- the thing about me is I fucking love that place. Sometimes. Other times it would just no, literally. It's the only place I had a breakdown where I was like, you know, the only time where I was ever looking at the crowd like, what, what, did you just come here for fucking heat? Why are you even here? Dude, I saw some, I've seen some of the, I, one of the fucking most bizarre heckles I ever got and one of the best heckles I ever saw, I saw in that room. All right, the one that happened to me, right? I'm yeah. fucking standing on stage, and there's just this group. I, I told this one time, I think in a special, or it was an extra or something. It was like four white dudes in the corner, dude, and you could feel the fucking anger coming off these guys. You could feel the fucking awful dads that beat them with belt buckles and shit. I, like, I've never felt an energy like that in yeah. my life. <clears throat> so I go on stage, and they're so fucking angry, and they're a little loud being drunk that they're intimidating the entire crowd. So I'm standing on stage bombing, and I know I'm bombing. <laughs> Because those fucking guys, their energy and everything in me is saying, don't say anything, don't say anything, just fucking get through the shit. And then finally, I was just bombing so bad I had to say something. I was just saying like, hey, what are you guys talking about over there? They're like, what? I said, yeah, what, what are you guys talking about over there? And the guy yells out. He goes, anything red and on stage is a faggot. <laughs> That's what he said, which I don't even know what the fuck that means. Like. It was just so fucking like childish it's and stupid, I just, but, but dude, it was hilarious. And I'm sitting there going like, I went right back into my act and I'm sitting there. Part of me is la- I'm furious. The other part of me is laughing my ass off. Cause I can't wait to go down the cellar exactly. and, like, and tell the story. Dude, that's like saying anybody who's sitting over there has girl germs or cooties, like something in the second grade, but it was still fucking hilarious. And I just, just eating my balls and they did nothing about it. Oh, forget whatsoever. No, will. And I just sat there eating my balls and got off stage, and I had to walk by the fucking table. It just, I don't know. That, that, they had that one, and then there was the guy. Uh, but it makes you better, man. Somehow uh, those make you better, man. It makes you not I, I didn't mind that in a hell room, but there was always that thing where, like, when if they if you're actually in a comedy club and they're not policing it at all, you're just like, so all you give a fuck is that these people are eating and drinking. Yeah. And, and if they yell at me or throw shit at me, you don't give a fuck as long as they pay their check in the end. But um, the other time... Uh, I don't know how to do this joke because I don't want to say the guy's name because I I'm feel, saying a name I, I, when I tell a Dangerfield joke or story. But go ahead. All man. right. So this actor slash comedian goes on stage. All right. All right. People are going to figure out. I'm not going to say his name out of, out of respect. So he fuck. And he's one of the funniest comics I know. I'm going to say it, Frank Santarelli. He's okay. one of the funniest guys ever. Oh, so, with the cigarette. I mean, he does a cigarette. Oh, yeah. Yeah. OK. Fucking hilarious. hilarious one yeah. of my favorites of all time. So he's on stage. And uh, it's just this fucking one of those summertime crowds where they're just fucking sitting there. And one of those things like, why the fuck did you people come out here? Exactly. So they're sitting there and he goes up on stage and he's on the Sopranos. You know, he plays the bartender and mm-hmm, everything. Mm-hmm. So he goes on stage and they're just not having it. They're not listening. They're not laughing. And his shit is really it's like Greer Barnes where like he'll go into a bit and it's like this 10 minute high level concept thing. And they're not buying it. So finally, you know, he's like 10 years older than me. So he's trying to reach out to this crowd because it's a young crowd. He goes, hey, man, he goes, uh. Uh, you, you guys like the Sopranos? How huh, you guys like the Sopranos? He goes, I play so and so. I I play the bartender every week. Uh, Tony Soprano beats the shit out of me. And this guy in the back, without missing a beat, goes, "He should have killed you." <laughs> Frank, I don't even know to this day if Frank ever heard it. I was like, "Oh my god, that's fucking hilarious." So, and I wanted to laugh my balls off, but I had to go on next. So I'm literally watching the beatdown that I'm gonna take. Right. It was like when your mother would line you all up and you know to beat you or whatever, and you're like waiting, like yeah. okay, that's just, this is gonna, maybe she'll get tired by the time she gets to me, <laughs> maybe right? She'll get a phone call or something. Yeah. So he walked off stage. I remember he walked by me. It's still classic Frank, funny as hell. Didn't say anything. He just walks by me. Just doesn't look at me. Just goes, wow, <laughs> <laughs> wow. He said it twice. <laughs> wow. And just fucking. <laughs> that's all you can do with that place sometimes. <laughs> I mean, Carrie Caravis used to be on stage there at night. We're doing prom shows. I used to do prom shows oh, yeah. there. Oh, no. I just, I mean, that's literally just go, if you can just go up there and, and stay up there for 10 minutes, you get your 50 bucks or whatever it was. It was, it was not about comedy. It wasn't about anything. Oh, you'd have a better chance going to Port Authority and just with a Mr. Absolutely. Microphone. You'd get more laughs. She would yell from the stage because I'd be last. She'd be second to last. She'd yell from the stage. Corey Alley, I got five, four minutes, five more minutes. How fucking jealous are you? Oh, and the crowd's hilarious. not even <laughs> mad that she's bragging that she doesn't have to be in front of them in yeah. five more minutes. Completely didn't get it. And the club, and the club would latch on to the weirdest characters to be their like comic, like the the comic of the. You know how like, 
you know, certain com- comics, like, Attell's known for the comedy seller, right? right. You know? The 12 o'clock spot. Yeah, yeah. So, like, I remember Dangerfields went through a phase where Steve Marshall was hosting all the shows, and he was their guy. And he's not there to behave. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm not here to behave. That's right. his whole slogan. So he would do, dude, it's so weird. He would do his last bit every show. He'd have a dozen roses. And he would slam each rose against the piano as he had a comment about women. Like, and then you blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then at the end, you know, the show would end. And then when everyone left, he'd have to go back in and pick up his roses. Like the club wouldn't even do it for him. <laughs> and, then, and then, like, I remember in between shows sometimes, because it was a Korean deli where he'd get the roses, you know. Right. They're like, Steve, you're next. So-and-so's running late. And he'd go, I don't even have my roses yet. I didn't even go get my And they go, well, hurry up and go get your roses. So he'd have to run to the Korean deli and get his fucking roses. <laughs> <laughs> Not to mention, that's half your paycheck and, and flowers, man, right? Yeah, dude. And Where all... are you going with that, dude? That's what, it doesn't have any Guilty as charged, dude. I remember I used to work in a dental office. <laughs> I worked in a dental office with my dad when I started out. And we used to have, like, when we were really drilling into somebody's tooth, dude, it was gross, man. Shit would be flying out of the mouth. So you basically had this plastic, it looked like a welder's mask, but it was all plastic. Yeah. So all the spittle that would have hit your face is hitting the dental. Sure. It was a fucking disgusting job. So um, I got the idea one night that I was going to put it on because I was so young. I was going to put it on on stage or whatever, and I was going to – this was going to be my closing bit. <laughs> so for like like maybe two and a half months of my stand-up career, I had this little duffel bag, and I would be bringing this stupid mask on stage. And the funniest thing was I didn't even have a joke. I would just put it on. And I would just say, like, you know, my job during the day, you know, you know what it's like working there? The job stinks so bad, I gotta wear this. And I would put it on, and they'd sort of chuckle, and they were like, and? And where does this go? And I would just have the thing on. And with the screen in front of me, like, muffling my voice, I'd be like, thanks a lot, you guys have been great. As I'm taking it off. And finally, one day, I figured it out. I was, I, I was talking to this comic, uh, Todd Parker. Yeah. And, uh, God, we come a long way. Holy yeah. shit, dude. And I, I said to him, oh, yeah, I actually thought that that was funny. So yeah. I, I talked to him. I said, you know, I'm not going to do that mask thing anymore. <laughs> and just, and he was, I remember he was sitting at the Kowloon with his arms crossed, looking forward, not looking at me. I go, yeah, no, I'm not going to do that mask thing anymore. And I was just like, and he just goes, oh, yeah. He's just looking at the stage. I go, yeah, I just feel like I'm just saying, like, I'm so not funny. I literally need to bring shit on stage to make myself funny. And he just sort of looked at me. He goes, yeah. Yeah, you figured that out? And I remember my heart sinking, going like, oh, my God, every comic was thinking that. And I didn't even know the whole, he's a prop yeah. comic and all that shit that, you know, those guys go through. Which I don't give a fuck if you use props. It's just funny. I don't give a fuck. Yeah, no, that's a different thing. But, I mean, if you're a prop guy, you're a prop guy. If you just got roses, I mean, that's it. It's like. You got, I mean, you got to go all in. You yeah, have, that's what I'm saying. Got, you either got a bunch of props. That's it. Or absolutely nothing. I mean, Vinny Favorino would have shut down the mask if you hadn't. Yeah. No, he would have. He, <laughs> <laughs> he definitely would have. Don't sleep on Pete Corielli's new special. Let me tell you, it's streaming right now on show.com, S-H-O.com. Just click on comedy. His uh, He does an awesome uh, podcast with Sebastian, who's one of the best comics out there. Uh, it's called The Pete and Sebastian Show on the Riotcast Network, which is www.riotcast.com. Uh, your Twitter is MyCorielli, C-O-R-R-E-A-L-E. Your website is www.petecorielli.com.